Well, that was a different introduction for me. I do campus ministry, so I work with 18 to 22 year olds who often intro me uh, for the talks that I give, and I've never received one quite like that. I did not know the elder team was doing that. I'm one of the newer elders on the team, along with Keith. And I had planned to intro by saying how much of an honor it is to be an elder at this church. Along with the men that I serve with, we want you to know that it is a privilege for us to serve in that role. And we want you to be able to come with us with questions, comments, encouragements, concerns, whenever you feel led. And if you don't know who we are, often, if we remember, we're wearing these little name tags. I forget 50% of the time Charlie hits 100% remembering to wear it. But if you have any questions or comments, we'd love to talk to you just to get to know you better. But like I shared, my wife and I uh, do campus ministry. And one of the things I love about my job is we get to travel a lot. You see, students are given breaks all the time that we get to go on trips with them during. So on spring break or summer break, we're often able to go on missions trips throughout the world. And so I've been able to go on many different trips. And our most common trip has been to North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina for six weeks in the summer. We went six different times. And I know what you're thinking, that sounds like a really rough destination. <laughs> North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, it sounds hard to have to go there, Jake and I will suffer and go. But honestly, it is a little bit of a suffer for me because I hate the heat. Like, I do not like, I was made for Wisconsin. Next week when it's supposed to be 90 sounds awful to me. But in North Myrtle Beach, every day starts at about 80 degrees at 6 a.m. And it just keeps going up with like 100% humidity. And I also, and this sounds bad too, I don't love the beach a lot. I love the idea of the beach. I love water, I love relaxing, but I hate sand. It gets everywhere. Like I feel like that entire summer, all we're doing is sweeping, because sand is everywhere. It's in our sheets in our bed, and I'm like, how did it get there? Ooh. I built my daughter a sandbox on that note of sand right before COVID. It was like the best thing I've ever done. Because all throughout COVID, she played in it nonstop. But guess what? Sand in the house all the time. So I don't love it. But when my wife was doing ministry during the day and I had to watch the kids, we would still go to the beach every day. Because it was either sit inside in a cramped little apartment or go onto the beach and let the kids play in the ocean. So we would go out into the ocean and I would bring a chair so I wouldn't have to sit in the sand or at least a big beach towel and I'd bring a book, because what I do love is to read. And so I'd bring a book and sit on my chair and the, on the towel and read while the kids were out playing. And I would sometimes get engrossed into my book, and then I would look up. And if you've ever watched kids or are a parent, you know what I'm about to talk about, is that fear when you look up and where you think your kids are supposed to be, they're not there anymore. And it's this four to five seconds that feels like 45 minutes where running through your head is where on earth are my kids? What happened to them? And it's one thing when you're at a park and you can rationally think, well, they're probably just in the slide. But when you're at the ocean, a lot worse thoughts go through your head. Did they drown? Did a shark get them? What happened? And inevitably, you look about 15 to 20 yards left or right, and they have just slowly moved without really knowing it because the undercurrent kind of just shifts them. And the same thing happens to them. There were a handful of times where our kids were out in the water and they would get slowly pulled by the undercurrent without really knowing and they'd end up 15, 25 yards down and they would look up where they thought dad should be and I wasn't there anymore. And the screams would happen. Screaming, wondering where I went. Because slowly they just drifted without knowing it. And I thought of that as I got prepared for this talk because what Paul is going to talk about in Colossians today are the things that slowly shape and form us. The things in culture that shift us to a point where we don't even know what's happening. But it forms who we are. You see, culture acts in this really unique way because the predominant culture you're in, you don't really understand how it's influencing you because it's just normal. It's what you experience all the time. And if you're not careful, 
slowly you start to shift and you look up and you wonder, how did I get here? How did I become this person? How did this part of my character get formed in this specific way? I love it how pastor and writer John Mark Comer says, he says, if we're not being intentionally formed by Jesus himself, then we are being unintentionally formed by someone or something else. If we're not being formed, intentionally formed by Jesus himself, we're being unintentionally formed by someone or someone else. And Paul today in Colossians is going to talk about those things that unintentionally form us. And then he's going to paint a better picture of what can form us. So turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 5. Last week, Chris Chris did a great job kind of starting off this shift in Colossians where it starts to get more practical. And last week was big picture, and this week starts to get more and more specific. So starting at verse 5, Paul says it this way. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on a new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So there is a lot in that text. And we're not going to get to every specific word and unpack what they mean. Because what I think what Paul is doing here, first and foremost, is he is talking about the cultural currents that are shaping the church in Colossae. We've talked about the background of this letter a few times and the different audiences that were influencing the church One is the Gnostic influence that would would impact them. It was this idea of a dualism of body and spirit, and they were separate. And they actually practiced asceticism, which would be an avoidance of pleasure. Paul's not worried about that in this text. Paul is much more focused on the Greco-Roman influence in this text, which is not at all an avoidance of pleasure, but an indulgence in pleasure. It's the do whatever feels good mantra. Of Rome. And don't, you do not care how it affects those below you. This was a very hierarchical culture, hierarchical, that's a hard word, culture. And the prevailing belief is you do what feels good to you and you didn't worry how it affected those below you. And that group did the same thing and the same thing. And we see a culture that would indulge in pleasure in every possible way. And so Paul's going to look at a couple specific cultural currents of the day of his audience. And the first comes up right away. It says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. And so what we see here is the Greco-Roman culture is an overly sexualized culture, a hyper-sexualized culture. And we could go into a lot of the details we are not, going to hit all of them. But what you need to know is in this culture, personal pleasure and fulfillment was of the highest value. How you could experience that, what that did, it did not matter how it affected other people. There are stories upon stories of the Greco-Roman culture and the dehumanizing of other people when it comes to sexuality. How people of lower status were treated so other people could have their pleasures met. And it was an intense culture. It was degrading to people. And after time, you start to view people as just an object to get what you want. And what Paul wanted the church in Colossae to know is that current of culture has formed you. You have been shaped by it whether you know it or not. And if you swim in that broader culture throughout the day, it's going to affect you. 
And you need to be aware of how this happens. He even uses the word greed here to talk about sexuality. We usually think about greed with wealth and finances. Here he talks about it with sexuality because it's again, it's just my need to get whatever I want to make me feel good. And I need that. I want that. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get that. So you can begin to see the culture's view on sexuality if he marks it by the idea of greed. And he calls it idolatry. He says, you're starting to, you will worship that over the creator God. So that's the first current that he talks about. That's true in Colossae. The second one was, is harder to define, but it would really be degrading or demeaning speech. And here's how I get to that. He goes on further in verse 8. He says, you must rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices. He has this list of things, anger and rage. You could think of them as inside, but often anger gets expressed verbally. I can be angry with my kids, but I know how angry I am when my voice starts to raise and I snap. And that anger starts to come out. Slander is how you speak about someone. It's talking about someone. It can be as simple as when they're not around, talking about them, and often in ways that are embellished, like talking about how bad they are. Think of how people do it with their boss sometimes. They're not that bad, but they embellish it a little bit to make them sound terrible. Slander is insidious because it attacks the character of a person, often when they're not there to defend themselves. Then even says, don't lie. And we see how pervasive this is because Paul calls it the practices. He says, these things you practice, it's, what, it's just what you do. It's what the culture just does. I've had the, the joy of coaching youth sports quite a bit. I have an 8- and a 10-year-old. I've coached them in multiple sports. And last year, I coached football uh, with a buddy of mine. And honestly, I think the kids thought football practice was really boring. Because we just drilled the same plays into them over and over. And they'd be like, oh, can't we try something new? And we're like, no, practice is where you learn so that in a game you don't have to think. And then we played our first game and we won like something 40-something to zero. And I remember looking at the, one of the kids on the sideline, I remember saying, remember how practice is, was boring? Is this boring? He's like, no, this is fun. Because what you practice shapes how you live it out. And the practices of your culture, the things that are normal, just naturally come out. And so Paul wants the church at Colossae to see this attitude of anger and rage and malice and slander and lies that is the practice of the culture around you will affect you. It will affect how you speak about people how you view people. And Paul wants them to see that. This first part of this letter, this part is almost like a pastoral warning to the church. Look at the current. See how they're causing you to shift without you even noticing. And as I was reading this and preparing, the line that stuck out to me is, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Because often people will say things like, the Bible was written 2,000 years ago, it's not relevant to today. And I look at this text, and I think of the currents that Paul is talking about, and I can't think of two that are much more relevant to our culture today. This idea of watch out for a hyper-sexualized culture that you live in. Watch out for a culture filled with demeaning and de degrading speech towards other people. How can we not see that that's the water we're swimming into? Because think of the cultures of our day. Think of the first one. This idea of an overly sexualized culture and greed. It is hard to find a TV show that I can watch with my kids and not be worried about the content. 
It's hard to scroll my feed on social media without some image popping up. There's one time I was scrolling and my son was like, what's that? And I'm like, I don't know. And I scrolled really fast. <laughs> because it is just so prevalent. The objectifying, the dehumanizing of people for your own wants and desires. We see it in the idea of things like human trafficking at the highest level. To devalue someone that much so that people could have their desires met. And that that's almost normal. How do we think that doesn't affect us? How do we think that doesn't form us? And how we're going, again, back to the quote from the beginning from John Mark Comer, unintentionally even, that is shaping our view of things. And if we think an hour at church on a Sunday morning is going to be enough to counteract all of that, we're probably being a little naive. So we have this idea of an overly sexualized culture, but you could go further. It's not a far step to think of greed. We hear that language. How we often use it is with money, correct? When you think of greed, we often think of that. And we're not going to spend a lot of time here, but Paul in his other letters, Jesus in his teaching, takes that same line of thought of greed and idolatry to the view of wealth. In his most famous teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about how you cannot serve both God and money or God and mammon. It becomes an idol in your life, this thing you pursue without even thinking about it. It just becomes the norm. And I think I've talked a lot about culture in a big sense, like the broader culture we live in, but this can be true of your family culture. How, does your, how did your family grow up viewing money and wealth? And is that what's shaping you? Or the people that you work with, they got a new boat, now I need a new boat. I found out somebody else just bought a cabin up north. So how are we going to get the cabin up north? And it just becomes this idea that our lives with wealth and comfort need to constantly be moving up and to the right. We constantly have to get more, achieve more, and get what we want. Hear me say there's nothing wrong with wealth. But the fear is how easy it can become an idol in our lives. The need to pursue more the need to have this. And all of a sudden, you're making decisions that two years ago you never would have made because you just need this next thing. And think of how that current forms and shapes you. And now we get to the degrading speech, this idea of anger and rage and slander that's become so prevalent in our culture that Yale psychologist uh, Molly Crocker, I think is her name. Let me make sure that's right. Yep, Molly Crockett has dubbed this time the age of outrage. The age of outrage. They've done study after study with her department looking at how outrage is actually monetized in our culture. That what gets you to click more is being angry. What gets you to watch that YouTube video is the headline that stirs you up and gets you mad. Often about how foolish the other side is. And you can't wait to watch, a, watch how dumb they are. And you click. And then the next thing you know, you click on that one and six more pop up. And before you know it, what you are intaking has drastically shaped your view of other people. It is really hard to keep reading or hearing about how foolish, how evil the other side is in whatever discussion you're in and to still view them as people with dignity and worth. And then it becomes really easy to slander them, to speak lies about them, because even if it turns out to be a lie, right, how many people have almost shared something that you found out later wasn't actually true? But it becomes easier to share that thing and be like, you know what, it might not be true, but it proves the point is still right. No, that's just a lie. But it becomes easy because it's the water that we swim in. The culture around us is doing it. 
I think about it with youth sports, how easy it is to sit with a group of parents who are complaining about the coach and just start to talk even meaner about the coach and how foolish they are for doing this thing or this thing. And I would never say that in front of the coach. But it becomes easy. Think about in your workplace. Again, I use the example of a boss or a coworker. How easy is it to talk about them in ways that are not honoring or degrading or almost dehumanizing them? So Paul's pastoral warning to the church in Colossae is so relevant for us today. But what I love is Paul doesn't stop there. Paul doesn't just say, hey, watch out. Paul is going to give a couple commands and then he's going to give a better vision of what it can look like. So I shared a little bit about kind of social media and the ills of it and technology, but one of the things I do love about technology is Google Maps. It is like my best friend because I am directionally challenged and I am constantly in fear of being late. Like I grew up in a family where if you were on time, you were five minutes late. So before Google Maps, for those of you old enough to know, there was this time where we had to print out directions or even get them told to us. And you would sit there with these directions, which would be fine. The times were always very approximate, like you'd get there within 15 minutes of the window that they said. But the worst thing was when there was an accident or a road closure. And you'd get there and you'd be like, I have no idea what to do. You see, what Paul's doing right here, he's saying there's a road closure. This is not going where you want it to go. But what I love about Google Maps is they'll just say, alternate route available. Do you want to take it? And I'm like, yes. I don't want to just sit here. So you just take the alternate route to get to your destination. And Paul's saying, here's the alternate route. And he does that first with three commands that feel very similar. First, he says, put to death. Next, he says, rid yourself. And third, he says, take off. In case you didn't get it, he says it three different ways. Put to death, rid yourself, take off. These things that are forming you and are moving you away from the ideal of Jesus, from the kingdom view that Jesus has, these things that are doing that, put them to death, rid yourself of them, take them off. So a little note on all three. Put to death. So we have had lice in our family two different times. Has anyone had lice in your family? You don't have to raise your hand. That's not something you usually want to tell everybody. (laughs) We've had it twice. It's the worst. I hate it so much. There are these tiny little bugs and you cannot get rid of them. The moment you find out you have lice, you go to like the local Walgreens or CVS, you get their home kit, you do that, and inevitably, as you're taking that weird little comb through, you find more lice. It was so bad in our house that my son Elijah joked to my daughter about getting it again, and she's like, do not joke about that. Last time, mom went to crazy town. (laughs) Because when you have lice, all you want is to put them to death. You just want to kill them. So there's this thing called a lice clinic. That's where we end up every time, and it's the greatest place in the world. They essentially just fry the lice in your head. It's like, it's kind of like that perm machine that used to be in salons. I don't know if they're still there but they just like fry the lice. Because at that point, you're not trying to be humane anymore. (laughs) You want the lice dead. And we laugh about that, but think that's what Paul's saying about sin and the stuff that forms us away from Jesus. He says, kill it. Put it to death. Don't mess around with it. And if that one wasn't enough, then he says, rid yourself of it. Don't have it anywhere near you. I had a season in my life where I just needed to get healthier. And so what did we do is we just got rid of all sweets in our house, which was horrible because I love sweets. I'm back on them. But for that season, I needed to get healthier. (laughs) And so we just took them out of our house. Rid yourself. What is that thing that is causing you to shift and kind of move away from Jesus that's forming you away from him? Paul says just rid yourself of it. If it's a relationship that you just can't be in right now, rid yourself of it. If it's a news feed that you're following or a YouTube personality, rid yourself of it. It is not better than the alternative that Jesus has. And then lastly, he says, take off. As in the idea of clothing, take it off and put on something new. So this past week was cut down week in the NFL. I'm a big football fan and it's, a, it's kind of a sad week. It's like rosters have 90 players. And NFL teams this past week had to get down to 53. So imagine you're one of those players who's like what's called on the bubble. You might make the team, you might not make the team. So you're playing, say, for the Bears. 
and you're like one of their last people, and your agent calls and says, I'm sorry, they decided to cut you. Imagine the just terrible feeling. Then what happens is you go on waivers, and another team could claim you and add you to their roster. So imagine the next day, your agent calls back. He's like, actually, I have great news. The Packers picked you up. You're now on their 53-man roster. So you immediately are going to hop in your car, you're going to drive up to Green Bay from Chicago, and you know what you're not going to be wearing when you go into the Packers facility? <laughs> you're not going to be wearing any Bears paraphernalia. You're going to give him that back, maybe burned it, you're going to hide it for sure. Because now you're not, the, you're not a Bear anymore. You're a Green Bay Packer. Any illustration to the good and evil of that is unintentional. <laughs> but, or intentional, um, I mean, I chose not to go the other way, so it's kind of intentional. Um, but you're not going to wear Packers. You're going to wear Packer stuff. That's who you are now. When you go into the community, you're probably going to wear Packer stuff. But you're definitely not going to be wearing Bears stuff. And Paul's saying, take that off. That doesn't define you anymore. And it's not healthy for you. Put on your new self. So he gives these kind of pastoral commands and again, he could have stopped there, but he doesn't. He ends by painting the better vision. Because you always need a better vision. Just trying to work harder is never going to be enough. You need the reason why and what you're going towards. And this is how he closes. He says this. He says, Put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So what is, he, what is this better vision? Well, one, there's a new self. And I'm not going to hit this as much because I think Chris did a great job of talking about our new identity last night. But he says, put on the new self. There is a new you. You are not defined by those past things. You're not on a predestined path to form to whatever culture's values are. No, you're new. You're a new creation. How does, how does Paul say it in other ways? The old is gone and the new has come. You are now defined by being a child of God. That's who you are. Live out of that identity. How much better is that than constantly trying to match up to the world's ideals and values that change and shift every 24 hours? You're a child of God. You're a new self. But then he talks about a renewed vision of the image of God. He talks about this idea that as a follower of him, as, as his children, we should have a renewed vision of the knowledge of the image of our creator. And what Paul is most likely getting at here is this idea that you, the, the audience, was created in the image of God, but also that all people are created in the image of God. So one, it's important to know that about yourself. Think about the worth and dignity and value that gives you, but think about the worth, dignity, and value that gives everyone else. If they are created in the image of God, Think of how that counteracts those two different currents we talked about. You don't view people for just sexual fulfillment and pleasure anymore. No, they are image bearers of God. They're not there to be used or consumed or degraded or demeaned. They are people created by God in his image. Think about speech, how we talk about people. How do you talk about fellow image bearers? Do you speak words of life? Think of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Think of some of those. Do you speak love and peace out into the world? Or do you speak anger, slander, and malice? Because if you view people as image bearers of God, that should change how you talk about them. It should change how you treat them. How you engage with them. I'm reading a book right now by a a biblical scholar named Carmen Imes, and her title is Being the Image of God. So it's one thing to even see people as the image of God, and then we're called to be the image of God to the world around us. We are called to reflect God to the world around us. That's going to be countercultural. It's going to be a new culture that we have to live out. How are we reflecting 
God to the world around us? How are we doing? And then lastly, he talks about a new community where there's no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. He's not talking about those distinctions going away. Someone will be circumcised, someone will not. It's pretty easy to know if that's true. In other passages, he says male and female when doing this. Those don't go away. But they are no longer the source of power and privilege in the new community. They're no longer the source of honor and status. Because, as the saying goes, the ground is level at the cross. We are brothers and sisters in Christ in this new community. And the church should be the most diverse community in the world because anybody can enter in. Christ's death was for all. And Christ will dwell in all who trust in him. Think of the picture of that community and what it can look like. That we can be this church that reflects to the world around us a place where differences can happen. Because I guarantee in this room we have a lot of different beliefs on stuff. But that we can reflect God to the world around us. That we can reflect Christ to the world around us. I just think of how beautiful that could be. That vision of living out this new kingdom where you're a new creation and a new self, where you view people as image bearers of Christ, where you are in this new community that speaks worth and value into each other, that encourages, that challenges, because nothing helps you see how you're being formed by the world around you than someone else sitting across the table from you and saying, hey, Jake, I've noticed this about you. You've just gotten a little angrier lately. And I just want to know where that's coming from. Here's the thing I hate any time that happens to me when someone calls me out on my own sin. But it is the best thing that could happen to me. To have, be in such close community that people can know me and be able to see when I'm drifting. So I don't have to get 30, 40 yards down the shore and look up and wonder how I got there. That a brother or sister, when I'm a yard or two down the shore, can look at me and say, hey, I've just noticed this. Are you okay? That's the type of community that Paul is saying we should experience in the church. But we have to be in proximity with each other to do that. And we need each other. We desperately need each other to be able to do that. So the questions we can be asking are, what is forming you? What are the most dominant things forming you in your life? And what are you being formed into? Are you being formed more into the image of Christ? more into that beautiful community that Paul paints the picture of? Or is it something that matches the world much more? And I think these are important questions to ask ourselves. What's forming us and what am I being formed into? What are those things that might be deforming us away from Jesus? And what would it look like to take those commands of Paul seriously? To put to death, to rid myself, to take off. Because the big idea is simple this week. It's the currents of our culture form us, but Jesus offers us a better vision of new life and formation. We're getting formed no matter if we want to believe it or not. The question is, what are we being formed into? And so what steps can we take to be more and more formed into the image of our Creator? Let me pray. Jesus, I thank you that you did not leave us to this task of formation on our own power, but you gave us the gift of your spirit. So Lord, would you fill us, empower us. Help us to be formed more into your image, that we would be that image as we go out, and that Meadowbrook Church would be a picture of a community that reflects you to the world around us. Amen.